an ordinary working woman doing a job that we consider to be menial, but with the same attention that a poet might devote to a line of poetry. Where did her silence come from? It came from Japan's free industry roots in Zen Buddhism, which is reflected today as much in everyday life as in Japanese aesthetics. We only have to visit a hospital in my city, Mumbai, to compare our so-called ordinary people with the so-called ordinary people of Japan. A hospital is supposed to be a place which should be ideally noiseless. And yet it is full of the incessant chatter of nurses, ayahs, ward boys, and patients visitors. It is like being in a bazaar or a playground fair. When I was growing up, the highest respect was accorded to any individual who was described as a man of character. We don't hear that phrase anymore because that is not the kind of individual that we value anymore. What were the characteristics of such a person? He was quiet, serious, disciplined, and honorable. With the coming of industry and the displacement of people from village to city, from fields to factories, character was replaced by personality and charisma. The charismatic man is one who is rarely quiet. He leads an active rather than a disciplined life, exudes self-confidence, and he finds that too much honesty is a hurdle while selling himself in the cutthroat competition of the marketplace. The marketplace, whether we like it or not, has become a compulsive part of our lives. Tune into any medium of communication and you will hear enthusiastic and loud voices urging you to hurry and buy this, hurry and buy that. There is no time to waste. Last day, last few minutes, grab, 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 or it'll all be gone. Your neighbors will have it. You will not think of the shame of that. Models in advertisements are positioned as our role models. Look how beautiful they are. Don't you want to be like them? The world's eyes are on you, measuring you up. What's inside you doesn't matter. What is outside does. In the marketplace, every individual has to be a performer. We have all seen what this does to a child who is shy and introverted. Parents and teachers worry about him. They thrust him onto the school stage to make him bold. Never mind what this does to him. The sea of faces before him gives him stomach cramps. He forgets what he is expected to say. He wants to run away and hide. Finally, he bursts into tears and does just that. Teachers and parents do not bother to hide their deep disappointment 
he has not allowed them to succeed in doing their duty by him. They wish to prepare him for the outside world, where the highest rewards are reserved for the bold and the beautiful. And he is going to miss out on them. Ultimately, a time comes when even the most dedicated teachers and parents give up the fight. The boy is left alone at last, not out of respect for who he is, but out of despair. Meanwhile, school bullies taunt him with the word reserved for children like him. Loser. If this child is a loser, then the winner has to be his opposite. He is the boy who is happy to have attention, to show off, to perform on any stage that will have him. Parents and teachers glow at the thought that he will grow up to be a man oozing self-confidence and self-congratulation in his success in the world. I met grown-up versions of such a child once when I was asked to design and teach a course for one of our leading IIMs. The course was on the creative journeys of artists. A progressive professor on faculty had decided that it would do his students a world of good to be acquainted with art, which functions on totally different principles than those operating in business and its management. I was excited at the prospect of meeting the cream of the cream, as the professor described his student. My course was to begin with five foundational lectures that would lay the ground. And then invited artists were going to talk to the students about their individual journeys in art. I was happy to see so many bright young faces before me. I looked forward to engaging them in thinking about art, its methods, its problems, its issues. However, even before I was 15 minutes into my first lecture, a student interrupted with a question that had nothing to do with what I was saying. It was the kind of naive question that the uninitiated tend to ask. The student asked rather cockily, I thought, ma'am, artists are supposed to be poor, but many of them make loads of money. How do you explain that? This question and the ones that follow were beyond my power to answer. They came from the environment where they floated around with no roots in reality. If the students did not attend to what I was saying, they would never get a grip on the real world of art. So I suggested to them that I would take their questions at the end of my lecture. Even, if, even as I said this, I knew from the student's body language and the way that progressive professor who was sitting in on the lecture looked at me that I had said the wrong thing. After the lecture was over, the professor said to me mildly, you know, we encourage interaction in class the students are marked on their class activity. Fine, but why, I wonder, should they not be marked 
on listening silently, absorbing what the lecturer was saying, and then asking questions related to that at the end. I didn't ask the question in my mind. I knew the students were preparing to enter the world of business, the world of cutthroat competition, where making themselves audible, even when they had nothing to say, would mark them as smart, ambitious, and go-getting. Audibility mattered. Silence was stupid and self-destructive. Noise has spread its tentacles in every field. We used to think that spiritual men and women needed to be silent in order to contemplate the universe. That is no longer true. They need to publicize themselves as much as any manufacturer who has a product to sell. Working on business principle, today's spiritual gurus first identify a need. The need, real or imagined, is for inner peace. Inner peace is missing in people's lives because modern life is fast and full of mental stress and strain. The spiritual guru then creates a unique selling proposition which will produce the peace that the devotees seek. This must then be sold to people. That cannot be done in silence. Gurus therefore give interviews to the press and on television. Their photographs are blown up to fill enormous hoardings. They flash grins at us, which are just as wide as the models in advertisements. Silence is for later when their devotees gather for guidance. Silence in there is then part of the total package, spiritual package that they offer them. Devotees go away thinking very well of themselves when they have been called upon to close their eyes, seal their lips, and declutter their minds in order to concentrate on cosmic truths. I once attended a popular guru's meeting because my hostess happened to be his devotee. While the charismatic guru quoted copiously from the Gita and other spiritual texts during his sermon, he ended by doing what he was famous for. This was his unique selling proposition, which endeared him to his devotees. He relaxed, came down to earth from his spiritual heights, became one of them and spoke in their lingo. In this mode, he even told jokes. But what I remember most from that a relaxed chat of his was the comfort that he offered his well heeled listeners. I know some of you suffer from guilt because you own luxurious cars, yeah, he said. But why feel guilty? Our religion is liberal. Yes, there is dharma and moksha at two ends of our Purusharthas, but in between are Kama and Artha. You are allowed to enjoy earthly joys. If I have suggested 
that such gurus are exclusively products of the industrial age. I'm wrong. They appear to have existed even in Santa Tukaram's times. One of his abhangas points satirically to the sellers of bhakti. The abhanga goes, Sartha vila vana, paisa ghatala dukana, se ja pahi je, se kali pahi siddha chi zavali. Translated into English, Sri Tukara Maharaj is saying, I have a stock of many goods. I have set up a spacious shop. Ask for anything, anytime, and I have it right here, near at hand. Artists form a very small fraction of this total population. And they are the only ones who value silence, seeking it in the midst of all this noise. Without silence, they can't work. They can't exist as artists. Without silence, they can hardly hear themselves think. There are, I have decided, three kinds of silence in an artist's life. The first is the silence that precedes a work of art. The second is the silence that exists within a work of art. And the third is the silence that follows or should follow as a response to a work of art. I will begin with a story that illustrates the first kind of silence. It is told by the illustrious art historian Dr. B. N. Goswami, in his book, Conversations. Dr. Goswami is in Zurich. He is attending a festival of Indian arts organized by a local museum. There is to be a performance of Kudiyattam that evening. The curator of the museum is very keen that visitors should have an opportunity to observe the preparation that precedes the performance of Kuriyattam. He has invited interested observers to watch how the actors prepare and apply their makeup. Quite a few people turn up. The actors are grinding pigments and making pastes in complete silence. As and when the powders and pastes are ready, they take turns to apply them on one another's faces. Again, in complete silence. This is done with meticulous precision because each stripe Swade and stop of color says something about the character that the actor is going to play. The process appears tedious and interminable to the Swiss observers. They begin to fidget. At one point, one of them asks Dr. Goswami in a whisper. Why don't the actors use the new cosmetic materials that are readily available in the market? Surely that will cut down on time. Goswami interprets the question to the Guruji. The Guruji draws him aside and says in a low voice, please tell them. We need this time of silence. We are preparing 
to enter the world of the gods this evening. Prabhakar Barve has described a similar process in his book, Kora Canvas. The artist is about to start a new work. Before him stands a blank canvas. He sits staring at it equally blankly and in silence. Soon the canvas begins to look less blank. The artist notices the weave of the canvas. The occasional knot in the weave, an ant scurrying across the frame. Next, the canvas begins to assume strange shapes and meanings. Finally, as Barbe puts it, the surface gives way to unsuspected depths where the artist's imagination rapidly follows. Meanwhile, a reverse process has taken place in the artist's mind. At first, his mind is cluttered with thoughts, feelings, and ideas. The artist needs to empty his mind of all this clutter before his imagination can create something fresh and new. Barve gives us an evocative description of the magical moment when this happens. He says, when the artist's mind breaks through the layers of accumulated thought and attains its pristine state, it is as though a patch of deep blue sky has broken through a thick cover of gray cloud. This is the silence that precedes art. The second kind of silence, the silence that exists within art, carries as much meaning as do words or images or musical notes. In painting, images gain meaning from the negative, negative space around and between them. Negative space in painting is akin to silence in music and drama. Poets ask for their poems to be laid out in a certain way that leaves a lot of white space around, or for their lines to be so spaced that brief silences are created between them. And we are expected to read those silences as we read the words. I'm reminded of one moment of silence in music that has remained with me as a vivid memory for several years. The Drupad singer, Pandit Uday Babakar, was presenting an alap in the Raag Bhaira. He is a philosopher of musician. He was exploring time and space through this raga, the Adiraga. At one point in his meditative music, he hit the top note, the shatya. He held it for a long time, then stretched it till all we could hear at the end was a barely audible point of sound. The sound was so fine that we weren't aware when it faded away altogether into the elements. 
in the silence that followed lay a whole universe of unheard sound. The musician was inviting us to listen to it with him. One had to be completely silent to share in the rich mystery of that moment. But sadly, our audience is not given to silence. A high note held for so long excites them. For them, this is not a moment for listening to silence in silence. It is an invitation to applaud the musician's skills long and loud. This they did and so lost the moment. The third kind of silence in art is a silence that should follow as a response to a work of art. The audience in this case has been found wanting. Peter Brook, the English theater director who passed away recently practiced two kinds of silence in his theater. One was economy of speech and gesture, leaving space for meanings to emerge and resonate. The other was economy in stage settings to cut down on visual noise. In Brooks' seminal book on theater, the empty space, he argues that if one man walks across a bare stage while another man watches him, they have created an act of theater. About stage setting, he says, if there is scenery, the space is not empty and the mind of the spectator is already furnished. A naked area does not tell a story. So each spectator's imagination, attention, and thought process is free and unfettered. In providing the visual silence of a bare stage, Brooke not only frees himself from realistic clutter, but he calls upon the audience to use the silence he has created to free their own imagination. The silence after art, that is the silence in which art is received, is the aspect that I wish to look at in Brooks work. Let us see how a play comes to be realized. The actors have worked hard, they have improvised, they have re rehearsed rigorously for months, and now they are at last ready for their final test, facing the audience. Brooke says, the great barometer is in the levels of the audience's silence. If one listens carefully, one can learn everything about a performance from the degree of silence that it creates. Sometimes a certain emotion ripples through the audience and the quality of silence is transformed. A few seconds later, the silence will inevitably weaken from the degree of intensity that it had earlier acquired. Then begins the coughing and the shuffling and the, visit, uh, and the fidgeting, which tells us that the audience is bored. 
This served as a red flag to the actors. For Brooke, it means that the performance has died on stage. Brooke did not wish to bore his audience. His silences were meant actually to engage the audience if the audience was prepared to bring their imaginations to the performance. But the Japanese theater director, Shogo Ota, although he was aware that his new work would bore an unprepared audience, he was willing to take the risk for the sake of his experiment in silence. Ota began by asking himself radical questions. Brooke has said very few theater directors dare to ask themselves such questions because they lead to a void. And a void has no markers to guide directors. Ota like Prabhakar Bhade, was aware that the truly new could only emerge from a void. And so he proceeded to declutter his mind. Why do I need costumes? Why do I need a set? Why do I need words? These are the questions he asked himself. And by process of elimination, he came to what he saw as the only requirement of theater, the human body and an empty space. With this in mind, he created a play called The Water Station. It is a play without words. I saw production of this play directed by the Kerala director, Shankar Venkateshwaran. I saw it at Mumbai's Prithvi Theatre. The group of actors that he had collected from all over India had lived together for months, fine tuning their bodies, to the slow pace of movement and the total silence that the play demanded of them. The stage set was a simple ramp that emerged from one wing and sloped down to the middle of the stage where there was a water tap, a running water tap. The continuous trickle of water and some music were the only sounds we heard. A dispirited line of women and men dressed in ragged clothes with household belongings strapped to their backs walked down the ramp at a slow measured pace. They look like displaced people. Coming down, they stopped at the water tap and drank from it. Some squabbled, but silently. Others embraced, but silently. Then they moved on one by one, also silently to the opposite wing and exited from it. Perhaps they were seeking a better life beyond. Their progress down the ramp and across the stage and out through the wing was watched expressionless by a man who sat silently on top of a tall heap of junk. That junk contained all the discards of our 
modern life. That man was our representative on stage. The audience was silent, but more in confusion than with attention. This was a totally new experience, totally unexpected, and they didn't really know how to respond. Gradually, however, they settled down the pace of the play and the silence. However, halfway through, some began to shuffle and some silently crept out of the auditorium. Of those who stayed, not all found the experience stimulating or even interesting. So what did Ota achieve by creating such a play? He proved to himself and to other directors that silence could create valid theater that mesmerized at least some people. I would count myself as one of those who was totally mesmerized by these human beings and what they were saying about themselves without speaking. To these people like me, he offered an, a rare opportunity to discover in ourselves the ability through concentrated silence to hear unspoken speech. For that is what silence is. It is wordless speech. The popular art of our times is noisy. It offers us bright surfaces. We get used to consuming it by skimming those bright surfaces. To offer an audience silence in the midst of noise could be considered, I think, an essential service. To give people the opportunity to discover that by being totally silent, if only for a brief while in the theater or in the concert hall, is to discover themselves anew, to test their ability to abandon surfaces and see what lies in the depths. The water station gave us the chance to understand what was being said when nothing was being said. The experience of the water station was not confined as far as I'm concerned to the one hour which I spent in the theater watching its slow, silent unfolding. It has returned to me often in recent years when the inhabitants of countless countries in Africa, in the Middle East, and now in Europe have had to flee their homes because of war and other man-made calamities. Finally, having made so much noise about the need for silence, I will add my last bit of noise by reading Pablo Neruda's poem, Keeping Quiet. Keeping Quiet, Pablo Neruda. Now we will count to 12 and we will all keep still. For once on the face of the earth, let us not speak in any language. 
let us stop for one second and not move our arms so much. It would be an exotic moment without a rush, without engines. We would all be together in a sudden strangeness. Fishermen in the cold sea will not harm whales. And the man gathering salt will look at his hurt hands. Those who prepare green wars, wars with gas, wars with fire, victories with no survivors. They would put on clean clothes and walk about with their brothers in the shade, doing nothing. What I want should not be confused with total inactivity. Life is what it is about. I want no truck with death. If we were not so single-minded about keeping our lives moving, and for once could do nothing. Perhaps a huge silence might interrupt this sadness of never understanding ourselves and of threatening ourselves with death. Perhaps the earth can teach us as when everything seems dead and later proves to be alive. Now, I will count up to 12 and you keep quiet and I will go. Thank you. I am, I think I need to be silent for a little while longer. I, I can't, uh, I can't speak as yet, Shanta. I just allow everybody else also to be quiet for a moment. We have, uh, we have, we have many who are still um, reflecting on what you're saying. Um, I'd like to open up the conversation. So participants, uh, Shrija, I think you can unmute everybody. And uh, whoever wants to say something, then participants can unmute themselves. Yeah. Good evening. Could I ask a question? Yeah, you can switch on your camera as well, please. I think it's uh, should be. It's okay. Uh, can you switch thank on you. your camera? Thank you, Shanta, ma'am. I'd rather not. Yeah. Uh, this is Subhant Bhattacharya from Nagpur. And uh, thank you for uh, 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 a very uh, disquieting and uh, 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 I don't know. I mean, I still uh, haven't quite emerged from uh, uh, what you have uh, from the spell of what you have said. But my question is uh, about uh, a theater. Maybe one play, a water station um, uh, would succeed uh, without words. But theater essentially an audio visual audio visual medium. Could we have uh, 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 multiple uh, plays uh, without? Uh, wouldn't it become too gimmicky and uh, uh, repetitive? And uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm just uh, thinking out yeah. loud. 
yes, but, you are absolutely right. Um, an experiment like that is uh, only made to prove that silence on stage is possible. That's all. Also, it uh, tells uh, writers and directors that they don't have to fill everything up with words. Even in theater, silences are extremely important. Printer, I, printer for instance. Yeah, I remember uh, watching a play. Uh, I forget what it was called. It was a Marathi play. And um, even when there were say three people on the stage talking to each other, saying lines which the playwright had written. My attention was constantly drawn towards the female actor who stood on the side listening to them attentively. Now, um, silence, if you accept that silence is a good thing on stage, then actors can listen as intensely as when they speak. So uh, directors and writers can take away many lessons from this sort of experiment. You are quite right in saying that it would become gimmicky, particularly because other people trying this, this experiment would actually be, be copying the original. Yes. So that comes without the kind of internal conviction that drove the Japanese. And that internal conviction, whatever kind of theater you do, is very important because that holds the audience's attention. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yeah, that clears a lot of things up. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Prantik has raised his hand. Yeah, Prantik. Yeah. Good evening, Shantana. Hi. Uh, I'm Prantik Banerjee from Nagpur. Yeah. yeah. Um, one, an observation, and second, uh, uh, a question. Um, thank you, for first of all, for such an eloquent talk on silence. I, while I was listening to you giving us the three categories of the relationship between art and silence, uh, then Satish Gujaral came to my mind. Uh, especially when we were talking about painting. And I thought it was such a, such a wonderful uh, example that here was a painter who chose to, who chose to not have, to, who chose to refuse an implant and be deaf so that his uh, in intrinsic relationship with art uh, continued to be more expressive in silence rather than in noise. That's right. so, yeah. so, so Satish Gujaral's ex, uh, example came to my mind. That's just an observation. Yeah. Uh, what I would like to also ask you, and I'd like you to comment on that, but also like to ask you, would you consider therefore mime as one of the most profound and eloquent expressions so far? Mime? Yeah. Huh. Well, uh, you know, as I said, silence is a form of speech. And if you watch a mime artist, uh, he or she is actually um, imitating actions that we perform in life. Um, there is no such thing, at least not in my experience of viewing theater, 
no such thing as abstract mind. So um, mind I consider to be a form of speech, wordless speech, but speech all the same. Would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, it kind of, it, it's again an example of aesthetics of silence, isn't it? And yeah. uh, uh, Satish Gujral, of course, as I said, was came as a ready example. Uh, yes. You know, you know, yes. About, about an artist choosing to be, choosing to shut yeah. himself out from all kinds of noise. Yeah. I do that myself because uh, when I'm working, I live in a house which has more windows and doors than walls. So all sorts of noises let themselves into this room from where I'm talking. And uh, in the evenings particularly, uh, a whole lot of children come down and uh, right outside my window, they play very noisy games. Um, I do a little walking around, uh, but then I uh, wear earmuffs because I need to hear myself think before I write. So uh, there are various ways in which artists manage to have silence around themselves. I will say that men are particularly lucky in this respect because wives keep noise out. He is busy working, don't disturb. I as a woman have grown up writing with noise, but now with age, I can't take it. I need silence very badly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. There was another hand raised, uh, Alok Chandra, if he's there. Any more questions? We have uh, in our chats, we have uh, a lot of praise, uh, Shanta ma'am. Just amazingly stimulating, Amol says, excellent. Uh, Neha Meshram says, ma'am, that was magnificent. Your words will resonate in each of us. Dumeshwari uh, Sudhakar Chavre says, very excellent, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> There's one more message. Uh, if anyone wants to uh, say anything, please unmute yourself and you're most welcome. May I? Yes, yes. Uh, good evening. This is Amul Padwad from Delhi. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Uh, and Shantam, madam, I noticed that you consistently use the word noise, which I assume implies that you have no objections to sound. <laughs> No. And I'm reminded of the use of the term noise in all kinds of sciences to indicate something as an unwanted element, something that has to be removed so that the functioning goes on smoothly. Yeah. So would you agree that uh, silence becomes a sellable commodity in the words of those people who are no more living with sounds but have already gone into all kinds of unwanted uh, things. The examples you give, for example, uh, the management students from IIM, where their life uh, is full of noise, uh, quote unquote, in the sense that they are no more listening to sounds which are naturally part of our existence, but are surrounded by those kinds of things which are not necessarily uh, constructive or contributing positively. So yeah. how do we uh, make that distinction as ordinary people between, uh, I mean, making a distinction in understanding whether we are surrounded by sounds or noises and how do we save ourselves from noises? <laughs> oh, I, I think at a very 
uh, primary level, I think our uh, ears, if they are in working condition, tell, tell us what is sound and what is noise. I don't think people, for instance, listen to a burbling stream and say, how much noise? No, bubbling stream is very pleasant sound. So um, I think uh, our ears should be able to discriminate uh, between sound and noise. And uh, I will say this much. Um, a lot of older people um, can't take a lot of modern music. And they always call it noise. So noise is something that is uh, not acceptable to the way that our ears have been tuned. I often think when uh, the Ganpati procession passes my house. I happen to live quite near the sea. So uh, all the processions pass by my house. And um, of course, working during those days is impossible. Um, what the noise actually is, is melody. They're playing songs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're dancing. And, uh, but to me, it sounds like noise. Mm. I go out into the veranda and I see that these people are not at all thinking the way I do or hearing it as my ears hear. Yeah. And then I decide, okay, let me join them. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid you will laugh at this, but it, standing in my veranda, I do dances <laughs> like that. And when you start dancing, then you fall into the beat, which mm -hmm. earlier you thought was noise. Oh. So there are ways in which you can convert yourself also <laughs> to be able to live with the environment in which you find yourself. But basically, our ears tell us what is noise and what is sound. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ma'am, uh, Supant again, could I ask uh, another short question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have read your book on um, uh, the theatre of Vinapani Chawla. Uh, would you say she was uh, moving along this track? The, the experiments in expression uh, using movement and uh, motion that she tried. Uh, of course, I mean, I didn't make uh, much sense of uh, what she was trying to I have not actually seen her theatre. But um, your uh, introduction was definitely very useful in um, gaining uh, access to her kind of theater. Was she trying something similar? Uh, yes, in the sense that uh, her, uh, she reacted very strongly against realistic theater. That's how her journey began, by rejecting the theater of words. Um, the one of the first plays, perhaps the first play that she did was uh, Savitri. And she carved out a 14 minute script. I think it was just about 14 minutes from an epic poem that had God knows how many hundred verses because she believed, as you have said, that movement is one kind of speech. Silence, of course, is another kind of speech. And uh, she went 
on this journey till she came to a point where uh, working with Kuriyattam artists, she discovered that the percussion is a form of speech. If you listen to what uh, percussion instruments are saying, then you understand something. And so uh, she created a play called Ganapati, in which there was just music, percussion, and some singing. But the extremely interesting point in this play was that all these five percussionists are playing on their various instruments and they're very happy with themselves because they're talking to each other through their instruments. Then comes this Frenchman who is part of this group. And he comes in with a saxophone and begins to play the saxophone. And the percussionists look at him very suspiciously and rather dismissively. What is this foreign element trying to intrude on what we are saying? And then suddenly, if you are looking and listening, you realize, good God, that saxophone is like Ganpati's trunk. <laughs> and uh, the rest of the musicians slowly come to an understanding that it's alien music, but it's music. And then they all start playing together. Okay. Now, no word was being said, but the play said all these things. So you're right, Vinapani was trying to cut down as much as possible on words. Your book was a big help in trying to understand her theatre because we, uh, we are not familiar with uh, this kind of work. Um, Ma'am, can I? Uh, Prantik here again. Can I ask yeah. you something? Um, okay. There's Smita? one question, Prantik, uh, from uh, Smita Kalikar. May I ask that first and then I'll hand it over to you? Sure. So, Smita Kalikar has written a question here. Uh, if Smita, if you want to unmute and ask, otherwise I'll read it out. Uh, she says, uh, Good evening, ma'am. Silence is definitely golden. One thing I realized while listening to your mesmerizing talk, if silence is so crucial for our inner peace and spirituality, do you think noise would act in a similar way for people with hearing disabilities? Um, I guess so. I mean, noise... Uh, is distracting, disruptive for us because we can hear it. If you can't, then, um, then uh, the very word noise doesn't exist. But from what I know um, is that uh, um, hearing impaired people feel vibrations and uh, if they feel vibrations perhaps they feel some vibrations are pleasant others are not I really can't say but uh, I will say this much that um, people who do practice um spiritual exercises. I think they come to a point 
where they can really control what gets through to them and what they can simply cut out. Maybe they just manage to cut out noise. And because they have this internal silence, that is the silence that they hear. Perhaps I'm just saying this off the cuff. I haven't thought about it. Uh, there was uh, Akhilesh Singh who had raised his hand and I think uh, he may have missed him. He may have left. Uh, yeah, Prantik, can you go ahead? Uh, Shanta, ma'am, you are uh, respected as one of the few writers right now in our country who is who refuses to be silent and who raises, who's never been afraid to speak out against a lot of things that are disturbing us. Um, you know, in a in an environment or in a, in a climate where uh, samwad has become increasingly threatened and voices of dissent get increasingly silenced, is it possible for uh, silence to be expressed through art as the loudest form of protest? Um, see, it depends on um, what art you practice. Because... Uh, Music, of course, cannot be silent. Um, it has to do with words and melody. But in conversation, silence says a lot. If ever you are face to face with somebody whose ideas you don't agree with, and it has happened to me. A conversation with somebody, a relation, in fact, who has extremely, what I consider to be extreme views about uh, the kind of things, in fact, that you are referring to. And because she is very close to me, I have argued and argued. Uh, but you come to the conclusion that uh, talking ultimately isn't getting through. There's a shutter. A shutter comes down and keeps out any opinion you may express, which is contrary to the opinion that is held by the person. So talking makes no sense. One day I stopped speaking in the middle of an argument. I just stopped speaking. And I think my silence said a lot. And this relation of mine in that silence heard her own voice. And somehow she came down a couple of pegs and said, uh, I understand what you're saying. And we left it at that. That was an admission enough. And it wasn't the result of what I had said. It was the result of my not saying and allowing her to listen to her own voice, which she found troubling. So yeah, in, in personal conversations, silence is often used to say things, but you can't do it in art. art protest and dissent is, is something that has to be expressed, not left unexpressed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, Vaijanti Asolkar has raised a hand. Yeah, Vaijanti. Vaijanti.
Vaijanti, uh, would you like to ask something or say something? You've raised your hand. Um. Uh, hello, thank you, Ruta. I was trying to unmute myself. Uh, good evening, Shantam. Good evening. Yeah, I'm a great fan of your work. Works. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, there were some musicians and composers who were deaf. And uh, they have composed brilliant music. How could they do, uh, do that? I mean, around them, it was all silence because of their deafness. Yet, they uh, created wonderful music, which till now lives, which is still being played in orchestras. And, uh, you know, those symphonies are very, very famous. Everybody almost loves them, those symphonies. So how could they do that? I mean, I, I, I'm not asking you a direct question. I'm just... Uh, yeah. curious the about wonder. the process. Yeah, process. How could yeah. they have done that? I wish I knew. It's a mystery. But uh, I don't know how... Uh, it, there must be a way in which they have uh, heard music. Because there has to be music in them for them to produce it. So the, the real question to me is, how does that music get into them in the first place if they can't hear? Yes. And um, do they wear hearing aids? Isn't uh, that possible? Beethoven didn't. They didn't. Beethoven, Mozart. Didn't. <laughs> I yeah. mean, not possible. They all, I believe, yeah. they all compose, but yeah, they see they lost their hearing later. So music was already in them, and uh, in the Western music, uh, the notations tell you what the sound is going to be, so you compose accordingly. But someone who is born without hearing. I really don't know how they compose music. It's a wonder. Yes, yes. Because uh, it's like uh, you create something, then you want to listen to it, and then you think whether the, there has to be some correction somewhere so it sounds more melodious or more music-wise correct and appealing. So all these faculties, they did not have. So how See, they must have that, done? Sorry. That process, once you have answered the question, how the music has got into them, then uh, they, they hear the music which they have made and they correct it accordingly. The, the main thing is how do they hear music at all in order to compose? their own music. So we'll just have to leave it at that. I think, uh, you know, we should ask them. They would be able to tell. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, yeah. I, I uh, suppose my question was relevant to what you spoke about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one final question. Thank you so much. One, one minute, Shupant. Yep, I have a I... couple of questions in the uh, yeah, chat yeah, box. So I'd like yeah. to get them through to Shanta. Uh, there is sure. a comment uh, from Kanchan. Uh, buddy, uh, thank you, madam, for letting us know that silence is so vocal, which we never thought of. Silence, and into bracket she has uh, typed Shant in Marathi, is hidden in your name, madam, she says. Lots of people have commented on that. <laughs> but my friend, uh, Kiran Nagarkar, long ago said to me, I wonder how you look with your mouth shut. <laughs> so I must have been very talkative. 
there is ashivani balkundi has written it was an absolutely wonderful experience listening to you ma'am thanks for explaining the unknown silence within us um anirja murthy has written a truly inspiring talk shanta articulated many thoughts that instinctively come to our minds but which we may not have dwelt upon and clarified to ourselves i enjoyed listening to her and i'm taking many ideas away to mull over uh neha meshram has said this lecture was pure bliss thank you very much uh it gives us immense pleasure to see and hear from such eminent speakers uh, yeah and uh, i think there are more messages um sk has written that silence makes us more productive santoshi bhivani says heartfelt gratitude so true silence is golden speech is silver and uh, smita had you had answered a question on a disability she says thank you for asking my question ruta ma'am i couldn't do it as i was surrounded by a lot of noise due to some procession it made me realize how important silence is uh yeah uh, shipant your question and then i have a small one yeah uh, uh shanta ma'am yeah. you have played sita in pearl padamsi's uh, production long back i remember uh, i have read the uh, reviews of that play uh, and um, what about the silence of the women in our epic <laughs> robert <laughs> how did you as an actor kind of discover that uh, uh, silence because i remember in your interview you had said that you were not really very happy and you couldn't understand what pearl padamsi was trying to say and you had satyam dubey in your cast so what what kind of experience was it these are icons we have only heard about <laughs> well it actually the play itself um uh, was um um dissenting play um uh, this was uh, uh snehalata reddy Uh, uh, her play, and uh, she was uh, a leftist, and uh, so she was doing a take on uh, the um, epic Sita. Uh, so the very fact that she had put Sita at the center of the play, and uh, it was a title that she gave to her play. meant that uh, she was uh, picking her out of the silent background and putting her in the center of the stage as a human being as a person and um i i would say actually that uh, the 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 space that uh an actor occupies uh that actor doesn't even have to speak the space makes his presence significant i remember uh there was this uh, uh festival of plays by dalit writers and uh, they staged the festival at uh, shivaji mandir which is absolutely the center of brahmanical theater if i may call it that and uh, many people asked why they couldn't have found a space that didn't already carry this baggage and the answer was we are claiming that space we want to be there we want to challenge those people who think that this space is their exclusive legacy so if sita is the title of a play and she is the central character that said a lot to me which in fact is why i agreed to play the role in the first but 
I mean, it, it was just my first attempt and uh, I was very nervous and I was bad. A, a real actress would have done a wonderful job of that role. I'm afraid I couldn't, but I didn't expect anyone to bring that up. <laughs> Yeah, you have written about it in your uh, One Foot on the Ground. Yeah. Oh, my fault. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was about the voice. That's right. Yeah. It had to do with, with the voice because Pearl I kept you, saying, I'm sorry, yeah. but we just uh, can't just seem to stop uh, listening to you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> There's a, there was a comment from, uh, yeah, thank you. There was a comment from um, Shraddha Jagirdar, if you remember, uh, Shanta. Hi, she was, Shraddha. She's not here any longer. I told her to join back, but she's written. Oh, okay. Thank you, Shanta. Okay. Yeah, she's written. Sh thank you, Shanta, as a writer and an editor. Your words resonated so deeply. I realize all the more deeply now how important silence is to our process of work. So she was there. I think I missed her message. Yes, I know. I saw the name. Yeah, she was there. So then yeah. in that context, I wanted to ask you a small question that we speak so much about the silence in theater, the performing arts rather, the silence in music, the pauses, uh, the, 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 the pause between two uh, sentences of dialogue, very crucial. The pause between two movements in music is very, very, very crucial. Uh, what about the pauses in... Uh, in the written word, in, in fiction uh, and in poetry, I mean, how would, do they, are they as, as, um, yes, yes. It, do they resonate, are they as uh, loud as the si silences in uh, the performing yes. arts? Yes. I think what's happened is in the history of literature, um, as we have moved into um, modernity, um, the verbosity of earlier literatures has given way to uh, things that are left unsaid, things that we read between the lines. Um, the, I wish I could immediately give you an example of this, but uh, a lot of playwrights do that. The unsaid, which forms the subtext of the text, that speaks just as loudly as the text itself. So, so yes, even in literature, even in drama, there are those pauses. You know, um, I think it was Mahesh El Kunchwar, I, I'm not sure, but who said that um, because his plays are full of these silences and uh, actors are often not comfortable with silence. So uh, directors give them what is called business. So because an actor can't just stand still and bring sufficient intensity to the act of standing still, the actor is given business, like if it's a woman, she will clean rice, or if it's a man, he will light a cigarette, stuff like that, which is called business. But business is often stuffed into pauses, which are significant, which are meaningful. So it, it's also a question of how sensitive and how skilled 
an actor is to be able to make the most of those pauses. Thank you. So <laughs> that has been <laughs> truly, truly magnificent an experience. This whole 90 odd minutes, more than 90 minutes, we have been almost for two hours, more than two hours we are here. Um, so, and I don't want to tire you out too much, uh, Shanta. So over to you, Shilpa. I, uh, before I, we propose the formal vote of thanks, uh, I'd like to just share with you that we had members of the press as well listening to you. And um, we had uh, poets, writers, teachers, students from all disciplines, um, uh, my friends, um, their friends who are not, who don't really belong to academics or teaching, but who are avid readers and theater goers. So a uh, cross section of society has listened to you today, Shanta. I am truly grateful for the silence that is so evocative as it came through your words. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all the participants here who patiently waited. There was a small technical glitch that we are guilty of. So I uh, apologize on behalf of our team. Uh, we'll try and make it up to you, definitely. But uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, yeah, Meenakshi is saying that YouTube channel is also full of praise. There are other uh, comments here, full of praise and full of gratitude, I would say, for articulating our innermost thoughts and for articulating our innermost silences, Shanta. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. And now Shilpa, she would propose the formal vote of thanks for this evening. Thank you, Ruta, ma'am. Well, uh, silence is something more than just the mere absence of noise. It can also be the presence of peace, clarity, and tranquility. With literal and symbolic noise all around us, it's important to take the time to embrace silence and use it for renewal rather than seeking even more distraction. Good evening to one and all gathered on this virtual platform. It's my privilege to propose a formal vote of thanks. I, Shilpa Sarode, on behalf of the Department of English of LAD and Srimati RP College for Women, Nagpur, extend my sincere thanks to our guest speaker, Shanta Gokhale, who spared time from her busy schedule to be with us in, on this evening and shared with us your thoughts on silence. Ma'am, your thoughts have given us a new perspective towards silence, especially in the field of arts. I thank Dr. Prashant Bokhare, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Gondwana University, Garchiruli, for gracing the occasion with his presence. I extend my gratitude towards the Secretary and Director of the Women's Education Society, Dr. Shamla Nair, and Dr. Harsha Zaria, CAO of Women's Education Society, for their encouragement and motivation. I thank Dr. Pooja Patak, Officiating Principal of LAD College, for always being a constant and dynamic support for all our venture. I thank our Vice Principal, Dr. Durgesh Nandini Titarmare for always being with us in all our programs. I would like to thank Dr. Dipali Kotwal, our former principal, especially Dr. Kotwal guided us right from conceptualization of the Dr. Narayan Memorial Lecture to its execution. We have learned a lot from you, Madam, and we will continue to seek your blessing. An event like this, cannot happen overnight. The wheels started rolling weeks ago. Our staff members worked with complete dedication for the execution of this event. I extend my sincere gratitude towards our head of the department, Dr. Ruta Dharmadikari, and my colleagues, Dr. Nidhi Meshram and Dr. Minakshi Kulkarni, 
for all the efforts taken by them for the success of today's event. I thank Kanchan Bade, head of the Department of Applied Electronics, for her minute attention to all the details. I would also like to thank and appreciate Dr. Shrija Kuru, faculty member from the Commerce Department, for her technical support that she has extended. Thank you so much, Shrija. A big shout out to all wonderful participants for being such an enthusiastic audience. Thank you so much and have a good evening. I declare the meet over. Thank you so much, uh, Shilpa. Thank you, everyone. And let's meet again for the third Dr. Kamla Narayan Memorial Lecture next year. Pooja is here. Dr. Patak is here. Yeah. Uh, I have no words to speak, Ruka, because as the title of the lecture, I was listening to her very, very silently. <laughs> Secondly, Madam is there. I hope she has left. I think she has left. Yeah. I think she's left. Yeah, she has left. Okay. Anyway, my heartiest congratulations to the entire team of Department of English for organizing Thank such you. a wonderful uh, lecture under Dr. Kamla Narayan Lecture Series. Heartiest congratulations to all of you all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank yeah. you, sir. Yeah. Thank you so okay. much, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. So can we leave now? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. We'll stop the recording now also. Yeah. Thank you.